Part three, building a healthy home. Hey, everybody. It's good to be up here. He's kind of relaxed in this um, atmosphere, and so I'm just going to lean in on that and just relax. And we're yeah, it's a conversation we're have today. Fun. Yeah. yeah, it's going to be good. Tell them what you, the bumper sticker you saw this week. I think it was funny because oh, so it's so Oh, so we're going to be talking. So obviously we're in our relationship and family series. And so today we're talking about relationships, not only marriage relationships, but raising kids. And I was laughing because I think it was last week I was like stopped behind this minivan. And this little bumper sticker, like this little decal on the back of her car said, motherhood, dot, dot, dot winging it. I was like, oh, she, we could be like best yeah. friends. Yeah, <laughs> every day it's a yes, new Yes, I just thought it was so great. I mean, how many of y'all feel that way sometimes? Even if you have like one kid and they turn out great, and you're like, oh, I got this. And then you have that second one and you're like, oh my God, I don't know what I'm doing. Second kids, raise your hand. Those are your second siblings. Come on, you don't want to admit it, do you? Right. Exactly. Y'all are the ones <laughs> yeah, that the showed us just the practice. love of God. See, and it's so funny because with the boys, I was like, I just remember being in that phase where I was a stay-at-home mom and they were toddlers. And I was like, I am like ruining them. Like, I don't think I can do this. I didn't have one to practice on first. I have them both at the same time. So, um, it's funny because we were talking about this week. I don't know how I learned this, uh, through my dog, but uh, our dog, Carly, if you know Carly, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Um, you know, I grew up in a household where we had, um, uh, uh, explosive detection canines or commonly referred to as bomb dogs. And uh, growing up, my stepdad was on the bomb squad, and so we were a part of a lot of law enforcement things. And it was really interesting because when you're in the bomb squad, there's, you're always like, man, these big news-breaking events. And so we had all of these very – the city paid tens of thousands of dollars for these dogs that are high pedigree. They're even – they're, they're – um, what do you call it? We're like bred yeah. to be explosive detection canines. And the first one we got uh, was a year and a half old and was working for the Queen of England – whenever we purchased it from England and brought uh, Mint was his name here. And these dogs were so smart, so easy. And so growing up in a household that raised mom dogs, I thought, man, I know how to raise dogs. This is easy because these dogs are perfect. Whatever. I didn't realize they're genetically just born that way. I mean, I just thought I knew what I was doing. And then we had Carly, our golden doodle. And she, she has humbled me to the highest level. It's like absolute chaos. Nothing yes. works. I can't teach her anything. And people are looking at me when she like jumps all over them yes. and slobbers everywhere. And they're like, you don't like to walk What's around the neighborhood. You? You're like, no, I'm embarrassed. She pulls me around. You don't the like to take her to the vet. Cause like her energy level is it's so insane. crazy. Yeah. And when we went to pick her out, we, there was Carly. And then there was this other dog that was like real docile and real sweet and kind of shy. We we're like, oh, well, we want her, you know, but we were like, we read something about it. I think yeah. the dog has to pick the kids or something. And our boys, it's like wrestling. They were five the years time. old at the time. Yeah. So. And so she like ran and jumped in the wrestling pile and they were rolling in the grass. And yeah. we're like, she's the one. You know? So <laughs> there's a humility that comes with it. We had two at once. <laughs> yes. Those of you that had one child and then multiple children after that, you're like, oh, this is easy. This is not easy. I don't know what I'm doing. That's what we're talking does, about today. There's does. a level of learning. So once again, you might say, well, I don't have any kids. This doesn't apply to me. Or I'm not married. This doesn't apply to me. These principles today are going to touch every part of your life and affect every relationship you have. And if you're a grandparent in here, you need to understand what we're going to talk about with kids today because there is a role Bible specifically says for the, I'm going to say wiser instead of older crowd, that you have a role to impart into the next generation. And it yeah. doesn't end when your kids grow up. So if you don't have kids yet... Uh, then definitely be taking those today. And then we're going to talk about marriages and relationships in yeah. general. You know, uh, we were watching this uh, sermon that um, was preached about eagles, and it was such an amazing uh, analogy. Once you learn about the bald eagle, the American bald eagle, it's one of the most fascinating of all animals. First of all, it's one of the most just amazing, majestic animals there are. But the interesting thing about eagles, you've all heard this before, they have vision like no other animal on earth. I found out uh, by studying that the American bald eagle can see at approximately two miles away, they can see a mouse running in a field. From two miles, a mouse. Man, another thing about them is they're very solitary. Um, they don't go in big groups or anything. They're at the top of the food chain. There's no natural predators for American bald eagle. But here's what's even more amazing that we really want to start off with. The way that they have uh, their, lay their eggs in their nest and produce their young. And one thing that every bald eagle does, mother bald eagles, builds the nest higher than any other bird. Mm -hmm. 
They, if they can find it, they'll be at the top of a mountain in a cliff. They'll be at the highest points of whatever area they're in. That's where you'll find an eagle nest. For some birds nest on the ground. Some birds nest just in bushes or in short trees. The eagle is at the highest point. And it's interesting because you think about the eagle, the mother eagle is teaching that eaglet is what yeah. they're called, by the way, eaglets, um, why they're different than every other bird. Yeah. They have a perspective and a height that they reach that is not like other birds. Mm -hmm. And I think it's so they won't mix with chickens. Come on, eagles <laughs> are on a higher level. Um, one thing, I just I love the math stuff, and you told me not to take too long on this because I, I tend okay. to do that. But they can fly at 15,000 feet at over 100 miles an hour and from two miles away see a fish underwater or a mouse in a field and swoop down at over 100 miles an hour and catch that prey. But what's amazing about them is that the nest obviously is built before the eggs are laid. Yeah. And I started thinking about the nest represents the home. All of us grew up in different homes, different kinds of homes, mm -hmm. different cultures, different generations. And the interesting thing about the nest or the home you grew up in is you can't choose it. Yeah. You didn't get to pick your parents. Some of y'all are like, man, I wish we could have. Some of y'all are like, no, I'm, it was pretty good. You didn't get to pick the side of the railroad track you were born on or the culture you were born into. You were just born into the nest you were born into. And yeah. your whole perspective in life is framed, it could be framed, when you start out by everything that you saw in the home that you grew up in. Yeah. And that is a thing that we have to constantly fight against sometimes. Mm -hmm. I, just jump in if you want to. Yeah, I'll, I'm letting you okay. take Okay, I told her I didn't want to. Okay, so. I've got certain places I'm going to jump in. Yeah, I want to just honor my wife because that's point number one. Okay, so, um, so you can't pick the nest you're born into or the household you're born into mm -hmm. or the family. But you can pick the nest that you build. Yeah, that's good. And sometimes we, by default, repeat mm -hmm. or recreate what we've seen. Yeah. It's human nature. And what I want to talk about today is we have to, on purpose, build healthy homes. Mm -hmm. Once again, you could live by yourself. You still have to build a healthy home. More importantly, if you live by yourself, you need to build a healthy home yourself so that you're whole, so that you're spiritually healthy and overflowing, so that when God does bring that person and your family does develop, you are whole and you're not broken or half of a person. Yeah. So we have to, on purpose, build our homes. And let me tell you something. It's not automatic. <laughs> Come on, some of y'all can say amen to that. You learned real quick. You thought you knew, just like we always thought we knew how to raise other people's kids until you had your own. You know, you're like, my kid will never scream like that at Luby's ever, you know? And then your kid laughs at you and goes, you thought you knew stuff, didn't you? You're nothing, you know? And then they go back to that place. So I want to read a scripture, and then we're going to kind of take turns here and go through a few points. It's in First, First Timothy chapter 3, verses 2 through 5. And this is the description that... God gives us of a bishop. That word bishop just means overseer. Today's equivalent would be like pastor, spiritual leader in the church. So a bishop must be, verse 2, blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not coarsome, not covetous. Now listen to these two verses here. It's going to sum it up. One who rules his house well having children in submission with all reverence. Verse 5 is the whole key here. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Mm -hmm. And I thought about that principle, and it goes beyond just pastors or bishops or full-time ministry. God is saying, if you want me to trust you with more, yeah. start at home. Mm -hmm. If you want to qualify for promotion, start at home. That means start with the foundation. The most dangerous thing you can do, and people do this, a lot of celebrities sometimes, there is a mask or a public persona that looks like everything's perfect. Mm -hmm. Or let me just say social media. It doesn't matter if you're a celebrity. And you can paint everything perfect. But if you're hiding the cracks at home and all the foundation issues, at some point, the more you're promoted, that means the more success, the more influence you have, the weight is going to increase on those cracks, and at some point, it can be catastrophic, yeah. the damage that takes place. Mm -hmm. So let me back up, Sadie, because no one said amen. So in First <laughs> Timothy chapter 3, God is saying, hey, if you want to be a leader and have influence and promotion, first start at home. Yeah. If you don't have strength on your foundation, then I can't add to you because it will produce destruction one day. 
Help me out, babe. Come on, somebody. Well, I mean, that's the first level of ministry, you know, that God has entrusted us with. As moms, even our children, um, I just think it's so important. It's the foundation. And you have to be faithful with what's in your hand uh, before God can trust you with more. So I love it. Yeah. So we're going to go through a couple points here. We're going to touch on marriages and relationships, and then we're going to talk about children, which something is burning in my heart about young people today, as you probably know if you've been here. (laughs) Um, But there is an attack going on with families right now. And I know that being in ministry uh, because I personally know the attacks the enemy's bringing. But it has been increased. I think with COVID and all that happened the last two and a half years, the enemy used that moment to create some chaos in people's lives, some hopelessness, some stress, because things changed so quickly, yeah. and we weren't prepared. No one could have prepared for what happened. Mm-hmm. And right now we're seeing some of the fruit of that chaos and he is going to try to capitalize on strife in your home, yeah. whether that's with your spouse or with your kids or even with distant family, or it could even be at your job. The enemy is attacking relationships and specifically the family unit and even the spiritual family, the local church and the body of Christ. And so I want to read a scripture as we get into some principles we want to talk about today. In Philippians chapter 2, um, Paul lays out the basis for healthy relationships, and this is really over all the last three weeks, this is a major point. We've been talking about love. Love is self-sacrificing. Love uh, gives and doesn't expect in return. It's just selfless. Mm-hmm. But in Philippians chapter 2, verse 2 through 4, this is the voice translation. I really like how it says it here. It says, here is one thing that would complete my joy. So this is God speaking. Come together as one in unity, in mind and spirit and purpose, sharing in the same love. So God says, number one, unity is of utmost importance. Mm -hmm. Verse three, don't let selfishness, say selfishness. Selfishness. That word is not about your neighbor. I want you to receive that for yourself. It says, don't let self-centeredness and prideful agendas take over. Embrace true humility. Lift up your heads to extend love to others. Verse four, get beyond yourselves and protecting your own interests. Be sincere Mm -hmm. And secure your neighbor's interests first. Look at your neighbor and smile at him. Secure your neighbor's interests first. That means first you consider the other person. And if you want a healthy relationship with your neighbor or with your spouse or in a working relationship or with your children or any, any friendship or family relationship, the first principle is considering them first. And so as we go through all these points today, I want you to just think about all the relationships in your life, maybe some that didn't work out. You might have had some friends you had one time that y'all can't stand each other anymore. Or if you see their face, it just, come on, somebody, you know what I'm talking about. You're like scrolling, you're like, you know, and you just keep going, right? (laughs) The enemy has those seeds that he's planted. I want you to get past how things affect you in this season, and I want you to think about that person God's placed in your life first. So we're going to go into marriage first here. A healthy home is built and not discovered. And that's so important. It's not going to, you're not going to wake up one day and say, wow, my home, my marriage is, I didn't know what happened. This is amazing. My kids are amazing. I just had no clue how this worked. You have to intentionally build a healthy home. So with marriage today, um, one of the things we talked about is doing what you saw, like I mentioned earlier yeah. growing up. I've, I've just heard um, so many people that are, you know, marriage counselors that will have couples come in and just the random things that they do, they're like, why do you do that? And they, they're not even aware that they do it. It's just what they saw. I know uh, one lady was telling me one time, this one couple, this the lady or the wife was so upset because the husband wouldn't like sit on the couch and like snuggle with her while they were watching TV. He sat on one couch. She sat on the other couch. She's like, why does this have to be? <laughs> and then when they finally kind of were talking about it, he's like, I don't know. That's what my parents did. Yeah. My dad sat over there. My mom said it like it worked, you know. And so I think just as we're building our house, I think just talking through those things, kind of why we do what we do. And it may not be, I know even just through this series, you and I have talked about that a lot. Mm-hmm. Like, I did not realize I do that. Well, man, oh, the root of that is this. Yeah. It's what I saw or this is what I no, or this is how I perceived it or how I felt. So I think that's um, important. And I yeah. will say, dating is an interview process. So some of you single ladies, do not rush or the men. process. Or men. Sorry, men. You too. Don't rush the process. This is an interview. I mean, you need to be asking all of the questions. Yeah. You need to be watching her in 
um, you know, hard situations, how she responds and how she reacts. I heard one guy, um, he had sons, and he would tell his sons, like, you know, put her in a situation that you know she would not like, like on the back of a four-wheeler, out in the middle of nowhere or something like that, you know, if she's a priss pot or something, and just see how she reacts. Like, when she gets muddy, does she lose it? Like, does she laugh? You know, and I thought, that's so cool to kind of, you know, Scary thought, watch yes, that and judge that. But, um, but, I mean, even when I was dating Jason, I mean, you know, y'all are going to learn his practical side, the other half. Today, you'll get to kind of see that side of him. But he can be so deep, which is great. I love that and admire that about him. But when we were dating, he would have these moments where he would say, God told me this or that. And I was kind of like, okay. And I was like, wait, we're not married. I'm watching. Let's see. God said it, you know. And then I would watch God do it and watch him walk it out. And so that built my faith and my trust in him. Hey, he's going to do what he says he's going to do. When he says God says you knew says that this, before we were married. Yeah. So there was no surprises there. Like, exactly. Uh, does he really hear from God? Right. Yeah. It was easier to trust. And so we were able to work out a lot of those kind of kinks yeah. um, when we hit that good old conflict And you phase. need to understand beyond, let's get beyond marriage for a second. Any relationship God's put in your life. If you want it to be healthy or get on the right track or back to the right track, begin to ask questions and learn their perspective mm -hmm. and where they came from. What was yeah. the nest they came from? Yeah. Because if you understand, there's a reason in our Connect class at Lights, when you're new here and you hear about the vision, we do a personality test and a mm -hmm. spiritual gift assessment test. Why? Because we want to understand you. Because if you understand that other person, then a lot of things will become clear whenever the background is included. Like there's yeah. things that she would say. We know each other very well now, but in the beginning, she would say things, have a certain look, and I would interpret that from my perspective, how I grew up. When, that, when I saw that, this is a bad moment. She's like, what do you mean? Because we don't understand the background. So the best way to be humble and have friends is ask questions. Come on, that's important. That's Where did you grow up? What do you think about this? How do you see this? So, I'm, so that being said, we're going to do this different. Normally, we're going to go through, in this part, we're going to go fairly quickly because I want to get to kids in a second and young people, but the primary needs of a wife and the primary needs of a husband. And normally, she speaks on the primary needs of a wife, obviously, and I would speak on the needs of a husband, and we're telling our point of view. But when we learn about agape love and how Philippians 2 says, consider the other person above yourself first, I think it's important that really I should be talking about the primary needs of a wife. That sounds weird, but once you understand them, I need to make that my priority, yeah. not me telling what I need and she's telling me what she needs, and then next thing you know, you're focused on yourself. I need this. I wish you did this more. I wish you told me this more. I wish we did this more. And now it's, this is what I care about, and if you would do this, things would be better. So you meet my needs attitude. Let's think differently now. I want to meet your needs. So number one, and this is not all-encompassing, so ladies don't like, you know, say, he doesn't know. Okay, like we consulted. Um, uh, and they're not necessarily in order of importance, even though this first one is very high on the list. Yes. But the primary needs of a wife, number one, financial security is huge, mm -hmm. um, is, is providing that financial security and that communication. Uh, because sometimes, especially being a visionary in the very beginning, our dating season, before I was in full-time ministry, I heard, this is one of the biggest tests that I heard from God, and I probably wouldn't be married to her today if I missed this, so thank God it worked. Amen. But, and don't do this if you don't know God spoke to you, because this sounds crazy now. You know how sometimes you tell your kids, like, I would never have you do what I did, but it somehow worked, but don't try this. Uh, but God said, um, I'm putting you in full-time ministry. I was like, man, I knew, I was ready, I was so excited. And he goes, but it's going to be a while, so I want you to go ahead, and I want you to leave the job you're at right now, and then I'll tell you what to do next. And I was we were engaged, by the way. That, that's not the best thing to do when you're engaged, to go, hey, babe, I heard the Lord. I'm going to leave my job. We're going to figure it out by faith, okay? And we're getting married in six months. Okay. And I, but I know what God said, so I did it. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing because... I watched. She, yeah, definitely. I think you told me, too. Right. You're like, this, if this is no God... Pressure, but... Yeah, like, we're going to find out if this is going to yeah. work. I was like, Lord, I think move. I fasted and prayed about this. Mm -hmm. But it's amazing because through those months, I was just... God was leading me, and I was serving at the church full-time, and I didn't know how it was going to happen. And literally in October, the beginning of the month, we got married on October 28th. The beginning of October, still no job. And I know her dad, too. I'm like, this is not a good thing. Like, I don't know if I said don't tell him or something, but we, I, I, I had like, a, I was like, this ain't going to work if I can't, by the time we get married, have something to say. And it's amazing because God used her that morning. You said, I was just in my 
morning prayer time and study time, and I just felt like she's telling me this, that God said that, um, did you say today? Yeah, today. That today is the day that you've been praying for, and you're going to be in full-time ministry we were today. We're going to celebrate that night. We're going to celebrate that night. And I was, that's a pretty bold statement because yeah. there was no hints, no possible way this Remember, could happen. Remember, I'm not the deep one in the relationship yeah. <laughs> either. So I'm like, wow, okay, I yeah. I was like, that's prophetic. I right. like it. Say yeah. it, you know. And uh, that morning, I got a call from our pastor. It was probably an hour after mm -hmm. she told me that. Hey, I'd like to have lunch today. Can you have lunch? We've been praying about this for months now, yeah. probably since God told me, mm -hmm. and said, we feel like now's the time. We want to bring you on full time and this, this, and that. And yeah. I remember calling her, and we were so well, all fired up about that. Well, y'all all together, which was so cool, is they Yes, me, we did, yeah. And they're like, hey, we just wanted to let you know. I think I told them, like, can this you tell happened her? happened today, yeah. yeah. So that was confirmation for me, too. So see what he was demonstrating and showing, I was following suit. And so God was not only confirming it to me, but through him. And okay, he can lead. There's some security yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. Okay, sure. I took too long on that one. All right, number two, um, a covering. A covering is mm -hmm. huge. I mean, you think about Ruth when she said to Boaz in Scripture, cover me. Mm -hmm. You know, there's even with Adam. Was Adam or Eve first? Adam. And so Eve came from the rib of Adam. So there is a covering that God has given every man to provide for his wife. It doesn't mean she's not going to be successful and have visionary yeah. thing. And I don't even mean financially. I mean to just be a shield of protection. And it doesn't just mean physically, you know, I'll protect you. You know, yeah. no one's going to hurt you. Emotionally mm -hmm. cover your wife. It's huge. I remember one thing we really struggled with is when our boys were very young. I mean, we went from no kids and we weren't kid people to twin boys. Of, yeah. of all things, boys and I remember and I talked about being home with these kids. And I really believed, like, I may very well mess them up. Like, I do not know if I have what it takes. You know, yeah. I left my job. I'm home taking care of them. So I did have a lot of, like, mom guilt in areas mm -hmm. where I felt like I was missing it or I'd get frustrated or whatever. So in that season of life, um, I was pretty vulnerable. You were very sensitive to mm -hmm. things about the boys because <laughs> you're sensitive. like, I don't know if I'm doing And I was at work all day, and she was just like overwhelmed, new season. And then one of our kids directors at the church we were at, um, back there in the kids' ministry, came to her on a Sunday and was like, hey. And the boys were like young at the yes. time, like three or four or something. Yeah. And they're great. like me. I mean, they have a lot of energy. They're pretty <laughs> hyperactive, you know. So they were just kind of like, and it was a class full of boys, too, all on top boys. of that. So, yeah, yes. so it was just Toddler. like chaos, you know, back yeah. there. And they were all just running in circles and whatever. And she was kind of stressed out and came to court and was like, we got to fix this. Like, yeah. it's not just your boys, all the boys. And, of course, we were on staff as well. She's talking to us as parents and as yeah. pastors, too. Like, can you help us with all well, this? we had you know, said that we're parents first. So if the boys are misbehaving back there, like they're not going to get away with it. We're going to come back there. They know what they're supposed to do and what they're not supposed to do. And so I remember it was just, he would have to be at the church early. So it was such a struggle just to get him ready and get him looking cute and all that. And then I had to sit on the first row and it's like, oh. so we're just running to get, kind of get them there and get them fed and make sure they don't have food all over their face. And so then it's like right after worship, my number would come up on the screen and I'd go back there. And I remember this one time I went back there and they were both like outside in the hall for everyone to see kind of thing. And they just had this like look of like shame on their faces. And I was like, what's going on? And I remember they were doing something silly, but I asked like, well, were they, all, they the only ones doing this, you know? And oh no, every, all of them were doing this, you know? But so I'm like, okay, but like, then why did you like, everybody is like looking, it's like the, you know, the hallway, like the parade yeah. of like walk doom of shame, or whatever. Yeah. yeah, walk of shame. And so I was just like, ugh. And I think after a couple of times of that happening, I was just so stressed out. I was like, if and they I call me again, I'm going to get them, like put them in the Sunday, car and drive home. Every <laughs> yes. church started and she was stressed. Like she couldn't think about the message or worshiping Jesus or anything. It yeah. was just like, what's going to happen back there? And I realized I got to cover her emotionally mm -hmm. right now. She's stressed. She's carrying all this weight. And it doesn't seem like a big deal now, but in the moment with twins, we weren't, we were sleep deprived too. So we were kind of <laughs> loony at, you know, we barely were there. And I said, no. I'll take care of this. Yes. And I went back and told them, I said, from now on, don't tell her, don't call her, don't do anything. Talk to me, and I'll handle it. I yes. don't want her to carry this anymore. And that was like, that's my Boaz moment. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. I was like, he got it. You know, But just stepping in and being like, no, like she is stressed out. I'm going to step in like I'm the dad. So if the school calls, yeah. you talk to them. Yeah. And it's easy for us to go, or, you know, you know like, you know, you'll deal with it all. Yeah. Or if the IRS calls, you answer the phone and <laughs> talk to them. Don't be like, babe, you tell them, what, you know, whatever. <laughs> Like, cover her emotionally. I know that doesn't sound huge, but I'm telling you, it's not just a physical protection. And there's also a spiritual covering as well. Yeah. Are you leading spiritually, or does she feel the pressure 
to get you to church or to get you to yeah. act right or whatever. No, as for me and my house, that's your job, guys. We will serve the Lord. Yeah. Create that culture. Good. Number three, involvement. Involvement. It, as simple as assisting with everyday things. Like um, I learned that quickly. You know, don't check out when you come home from work. Don't, you know, be present. Uh, mm-hmm. It's easy because one of the things with guys is we need some, like, detox time just mentally after a long day it's like i have to at least have 15 minutes where i'm like i can't go right into a conversation or anything right now i just need to sit for a second take catch my breath you know but recognizing that there is a time to connect together and not be parallel you know you can do life next to each other and how many people have told you when their kids moved out of the house they looked at their person their wife or husband said you're a stranger i don't know you why because we were just coexisting for all these years you have to connect and have involvement and listen company is not companionship it's good just because you're in company with each other doesn't mean you're in companionship yeah. and that's not even in a marriage that's in any relationship mm-hmm. you know i i think sometimes for me i'm like man if we're in the same room that's some quality time right there like i like just spending time watching a movie with you you know but to her that's not companionship let's communicate a little bit and i'm like why we're let me just put my arm around you and be in the moment great how are you You know, asking questions once again. Stability is another one, number four. Just consistency. When you make a decision, unless it's, you got to humble yourself and if it's wrong, but don't be so fickle, you know. Sometimes it's just knowing if God said it, I'm going to stay with it. I'm not going to quit every three days. I'm not going to get this job and say I hate it or, you know, tell this one thing and then forget about it or go back on my word. Be a man of your word. And have quality time, maybe even schedules, you know. Mm-hmm. One thing I'm trying to do in this season is be more scheduled with our family and say, this day, I'm going to commit to this. Mm-hmm. I am going to take you on those date nights on Friday night. I'm going to have quality times with the boys. Mm-hmm. We're going to have our Bible study at night. Just being consistent. Why? That creates peace in the home. Yeah. When you don't know what to expect every day mm-hmm. and you're flying by the seat of your pants, as they say, then you're creating instability in your spouse and with your children and everyone around you. Who knows what's going to happen today? Mm -hmm. Instead of saying, here's, we're offensive. Here's the way we're going in life, Mm -hmm. and we'll deal with whatever comes, but we're not reactive in saying, well, we'll just see how it happens, and I'll try to clean up the mess afterwards. There's a consistency there Mm -hmm. uh, and stability there. Uh, And then number five, empathy. I wrote here, the ability to understand and share the feelings of another. Listen, don't fix Come on, it's easy to try to fix things, and I've learned just listen. A touch, a look, and a soft word. James 1.19 says, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man, come on, that says man, be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. And so sometimes you'll even say, I don't know why I'm feeling this way. Who knows what's causing this, but I feel this way. You know, it could be hormonal, it could be whatever, and I'm just like, yeah, I understand totally. And I'm going to listen to, and I, I'm a fixer, so I usually try to do something and go, you know, I remember I made the biggest mistake. How many of you, I need you to humble yourself and tell me I'm not the only one. She was stressed about the morning routine and how oh. crazy our life was in the mornings during that season when the boys were young, getting them ready for daycare in their first years of school. Can we say why? So in You're going to cover, yes. In, I don't, my, yes. in my perspective or my thought process was <laughs> I was trying to cover him because he has to preach and all that kind of stuff, and he just focuses best in the morning. So he would get up really early every morning and spend hours, I would call it the holy of holies, like sitting in his holy chair. I mean, he has like noise-canceling headphones on. So I'm like <laughs> running around with my hair on fire, you know, trying to get toddlers and kids and packing lunches and all this stuff. And I'm and like, yes, just like, Lord, we love you. Yeah, it was very holy. hard for her. So, yes. <laughs> I had a smile on my face. Coffee she's sweating and with a little <laughs> heater so it stays hot, you know. And I'm like, I need the coffee, all of it. You know, we're running around. And so what was your response? So you were, well, because you were just talking about that. And now I understand that I was off. But in the moment, I didn't. So she's like, I just don't have enough time and whatever. And I think she was kind of trying to say, like, could you help sometimes? Like, I know, can you take a five-minute prayer break and at least help get the boys Jesus dressed will for school or whatever, you know? Yes. Uh, but I was trying to fix it instead of just listen. I didn't hear all of that when she was sharing. I just heard, oh, you're stressed. And then I just tuned out the next 10 and minutes And you know when you're a mom, you cannot... <laughs> like really relax when you have little kids until they're like in bed asleep and then you don't know what to do with yourself because all day you've been doing all the things right so then you want to stay up a little bit later just to kind of have some time to like decompress and like Mm -hmm. you know shower or something you know maybe eat (laughs) eat, something like that 
So I was kind of in that season of life. All right, life. so we set it up for the worst statement ever now, and you're all going to know how dumb I was. So I was like, I have a solution. If you would just get up earlier, things would go well. <laughs> I was like, Makes you're sense, sleeping in too late, and then you're trying to rush it all at the last second. I got up at 4 a.m. and prayed for three. I was like, just get up I've at like two five. Cups of coffee. That was the look she gave me, the instant. It's like the words bounced off her forehead and punched me in the face immediately. <laughs> But the point is, don't try to fix it all. Uh, not like that. But I was just being practical. I, there was, was no emotion. I was yes. like, okay, not enough time. Makes sense. Add more time. I mean, that's how guys think. We're like, this is not that hard, you know. But there was more to it. Everything's connected. Everything's connected. Yes. All right, let's move on. For me, primary needs of a husband. <laughs> five needs will move through oh, these. Gosh, I love it. Okay, so I'm going to go through the five primary needs of a husband um, and I think I've just learned more and more of these kind of as we've yeah. been married and gone along. So the first one I will say, uh, which most women may not understand, is respect. Respect mm-hmm. is the first one. I think a lot of women think, oh, men, physical. It's a physical. It's really not. It is respect first and foremost. If they don't feel respected, they feel defeated. And I think sometimes if some of us are a little sassy, because I know I can kind of be that way, um, I really have to watch that and guard that because I don't want to disrespect him, especially in front of other people, people that he's leading, um, you know, because obviously we, I know his weaknesses. He knows my weaknesses, you know, but I think to, to cover him in that sense and just to still honor and respect. And honor is part of that too. It's huge. You know, it's not just like respect in the sense of men between men have a respect and it's not really what we're talking about. It's even just whenever there could be an insecurity. Mm-hmm. If we're in a season of transition, for example, and as a guy and we're like, man, I'm like when I was obedient, left my job and looked for the worst thing she could have done every day is every day reminded me of like, you don't have a job. Like you're pretty much a loser. Like, why are you doing this? Like to minimize that. And then all of a sudden what happens to a man, there's walls that go up. We just shrink in and we hold it in. And if there's a lack of honor there to know that you trust and honor in spite of certain things, mm-hmm. it, it's like a reflective thing. All of a sudden there's honor on both sides. So very important. And I know respect between men is a big deal. So respect and honor from a wife is priceless. I think every man, every man wants to hear or at least feel, I, I trust you, you. Yeah. I believe in you, and yes, girls, I want you. <laughs> they mm-hmm. want to hear all of those things. Mm-hmm. But when all of those Confidence. things are in a line, you know, are in line, then everything else in life is good. You're able to fire on all cylinders. I mean, to this day, when I, on a Sunday, I'll, first thing I'll do, I want to know what she thought. I, ne- I learned not to ask any of y'all, but I'll ask her. I'll say, how did you like the message? I'm kidding, but... Because I want to know, and sometimes, and even whenever there's correction that's needed, she's like, well, you did great. This one part, though, it lasted too long. But because I know there's honor there and she cares, her words carry a lot of weight with me. Yeah. And so she knows how to say it. It's not like, wasn't that good? It's like, maybe you're always amazing. There's just one thing. Because it can wound me like no one else's words. Mm-hmm. You know, what she says, oh, I just think you're not good at that. You don't believe in that. That can affect me. And so it's huge to have that in a marriage, for sure. So number one is respect. Number two is the physical intimacy. Mm -hmm. Uh, When Adam's rib was taken, it created a physical desire to have oneness with Eve again. And I will give some advice to some married, I, I emphasize married ladies here. When your husband is about to go out of town on a business trip, there is one person that can fill his love tank, and that is you. <laughs> so or make sure yeah. that it is full, okay? And just, I think just being, you know, and listening to him and Paul being said, available. Don't be apart for too long yeah. because the enemy will come in yes. and bring a deception in there. Again, when that tank is full, all's well in the world. Yeah. When it's on E, there is a struggle that is happening, and you're leaving him defenseless. You're leaving him vulnerable, and we don't want to do that, right? He's our covering. We need him to be strong for yep. our family and all of that good yep. stuff. So yep. respect is number one. Physical intimacy is number two. And then three is daily reflect, reflection. And I had to learn this one, I think, because like you were saying, you would come home and I had been doing all the things. I mean, we have like 45 tabs open in our brain all the time. He's got one. <laughs> so when he comes home, he's like, oh, I'm, I'm stressed, you know, and needs to kind of kind of um, reflect. So most men have a hardwired need for daily silent, silent reflection. They need to unplug and decompress. So I learned when you come home, I can say hello, you know, give you a kiss, hug you, and then just kind of let you do your thing and kind of decompress. You're kind of 
I don't know what you're doing. If you're filing through kind of all the things of the day and just kind of releasing nothing, really. it all. I'm just taking a breath, yeah. <laughs> but I can, I notice kind of when you come Because you used around, to go right into a conversation. I was like, uh, yes, uh, I just and walked I was in like, the door. I haven't even set my thing yes. down. Yeah. Well, you know, I was with kids all yeah. day. So it's like fire hose, blah, blah, And he's like, whoa. And I realized like this yeah. is not working. But it seems like about 15 minutes or so later, he kind of comes around and wants to talk. Hey, how was your day? And how did this go? Mm-hmm. And so we've noticed that's kind of a good thing for you to kind yeah. of get settled in and decompress. Uh, Men have an invisible emotional pipeline where all his emotions flow through. It can get clogged occasionally. Uh, And we, you know, we talk about this all the time in a lot of our um, classes and stuff, but we just, we can function well with all of our like tabs open and we can jump from one to the next and it's super easy. And it's not that easy for you. You just have one and it is there. And if he's not on that subject, it's like, we gotta wait for it to close up. And then kind of open the next one. Because if you would bring up like three problems immediately, you're like, like, okay, the boys got in trouble at school today. Toilet's not working over here. And we need to figure out what we're doing about our insurance. And I was like, I, I, I I'm stressed now. I like, can I just <laughs> yes. sit down for a second? I'll talk to the boys and then we'll talk about the rest. Yeah. Yes. So this isn't an excuse, you know, guys, to lay in a recliner and ignore your family. But do your best. Um, ladies, to give your husband that time just to kind of decompress. It makes a a big difference. And then number four is they need to feel productive. Genesis 2.15 says, Then the Lord God took the man and placed him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate and keep it. A man's confidence and identity can be wrapped up in what he contributes. Men get fulfillment in providing for their family. So I think sometimes, you know, if you maybe y'all set a savings goal or something, you know, and he's been focusing on that and hit that savings goal or, or a trip or something maybe that you wanted to go on that he kind of been, has been setting money aside or planning for that. I think it, praise is important. I'm learning that with little boys, you know, a lot, men, most men, I feel like the words the of affirmation part, kind yeah. of guys. Yeah. So I think when we congratulate and say, wow, this is great. This blesses me. Thank you for thinking of me and doing this. And, or I feel like, you know, I had a part to play. We partnered on this, you know, savings plan, and, mm-hmm. and we hit our goal. We made it, you know. So things like that, I think, read, make a big read difference. Read the rest from here down because it's a good point, too. Okay. Men can gain deep levels of satisfaction, energy, and self-respect from what they produce daily through their career and or service. If he loses his job, he can lose his sense of purpose. Men want to know their work is making a positive difference. A wife's words and actions have the power to make a husband feel like a hero or a zero. So build him up and help him become the best version of himself. Affirm your husband's work inside and outside of the home and look for ways to encourage and support his endeavors. And that's part of the tank. You don't want either side, the wife or the husband, or really even your kids, looking for affirmation anywhere else other than the home first. Because if a young person isn't getting affirmation at home, if your spouse isn't getting affirmation at home, mm-hmm. people need affirmation at some point. Yeah. You don't want outside forces having that much impact and influence over your spouse yeah. or your kids or in your home. It's yeah. huge. And I know even just the other day, I, you know, fall's here, so we love our fall candles, ladies, and all of our little arrangements and stuff. And it was a Saturday morning. It was cool, and I was at home, kind of lit the candles and stuff, and I just went up to you and was like, babe, I'm so thankful for our life and for this home. And, like, you, mm-hmm. like you've built a great life for us. You know, the boys and I, like, we're happy. We're healthy. You know, this is, it's stable. It's a safe place. And um, just trying to, again, yeah. just affirm and say I appreciate all that you're doing. I see it and it matters. Um, and the fifth one is fun together. And this one, uh, marriage is about fulfillment. Fun is a primary emotional connection point for men. I know with Jason, we laugh because I can be so serious and I can be such a perfectionist sometimes. And I think one of his favorite things is like if we're in the car, like on a road trip or date night or something like that, and you get on your humor kick and he just like makes me laugh uncontrollably, like where I cannot get like yeah. I can't get it back you know yeah. it just he loves that yeah. he has you've said that a couple times like where I just laugh uncontrollably and I just yeah. you're like it just makes me smile. just laughing like, just, together yeah. just like enjoying life and not always business like what do the kids do what do we need to do here yeah have fun yeah. and it's different ever her parents golf together I mean they just found that that's probably not something we're well, gonna do it's not her thing but me. everybody has just a connection point you know <laughs> I definitely like to golf but we'll see if the hey, Lord but tells you her. like to walk through showcase of homes with me. I do. Like I do. That. We're doing that today, actually, yeah. looking at model so, homes. So, see, it's love. We're going to have some fun together. Yes, we are. <laughs> Even after church today. <laughs> right. Um, kids, <laughs> this is huge, and I don't have much time here, and I want, I, 
I have had such a burden in my heart about this younger generation, mm-hmm. obviously because my kids are at a critical age too, so it's even in my face more. Yeah. But it's even being a youth pastor years ago and all the years of ministry, and I've seen even dealing with adults and how the majority of problems, addictions, pain, destruction in every life comes from the years when they were moldable, comes from things yeah. in childhood. And that's not just the youngest children. That's just when you're developing emotionally and spiritually. Mm -hmm. And so we have to, as the body of Christ, as the church, and as families, need to do a better job of being attentive and intentional with the young people in our lives, whether it's your kids, your grandkids, nieces and nephews, even as a church member, other young people that you're not physically related to, to, like, speak into them to provide that confidence, to give some direction. And as parents, even more important than anything, in this generation with all this kind of stuff, technology, the seeds that go into their heart through their eyes and ears at young ages go into the soil of their heart. Mm -hmm. And if we don't protect that and they have just open gates that are receiving whatever the world throws, that's part of the main reason there's so much chaos, destruction, and godlessness in our culture is because kids were exposed their purity and their childhood was not protected in all ways. Mm-hmm. And you might love your kids with all of your heart, but if you're not uh, on top of what they see on their phone, their iPad or their computer or the TV, then you are not raising them like you think. The world is raising them. And yeah. you've got to look. I don't care if you feel like you're being a little overkill on it. Mm-hmm. There's a, a level and of trust. you will feel like you're... You will when they're younger. Now, if they're 16, I think, you know, you need to start younger than that or you're kind of behind the, the curve there. But with our boys, just staying on top of that. I know that's a point. I'm sorry. I'm going to get to that in a second. Here's what I want to say. You are the thermostat of your home. Mm-hmm. So you can live by yourself. You can be a mother, a father, whatever. You're the thermostat of your home. That means spiritually, emotionally, physically, you set the tone. Yeah. And, I, and I mean, if you're a wife or a husband, it doesn't matter. Both of you are the thermostat. Mm-hmm. There are times that I come home. And if I'm stressed or frustrated one day, she could be in the greatest mood. And I, in five seconds, I can pull her out of that and take her to the dumps with me and vice versa. <laughs> and my kids the same way. Yeah. And, or maybe they've had a rough day. Mm-hmm. I don't need to jump into that with them and, and complain and say, I just, you know, life's hard. You set the temperature. It doesn't mean we don't have empathy and work through things together. But more than emotionally, spiritually setting yeah. the temperature. And I had to get to the point, even in full-time ministry, where I am more intentional on the spiritual health of our family. Because it's not osmosis. It's not like, well, I'm a pastor, and the word goes forth, and therefore we're all going to just be perfect. No, we have to talk through these things. And I tell the boys every night, we get out the devotional, we read. All day long, I'm using moments to teach them about things. And here's what I want to say. You have to, parents, grandparents, aunts and uncles, I don't care who you are, any young person around you, your responsibility from God is to help frame their outlook on life while they're still moldable. Mm-hmm. It's showing them this is right, this is wrong. This is what God says, that's what the world says. This is light, this is darkness. And giving them what that looks like yeah. and not having them defined by what YouTube says. Yeah. And it takes a lot of work. It I am really constantly does. monitoring. Who, what channels do you like on YouTube? Let's watch them together. I'll walk in the room, and they'll be on their iPad, and I'll go, stop right now, pause it. They're like, what? I'll go, what are you watching right now? Now, if they're 16, you don't trust me. But at 12, no, I don't. I don't have to. You're 12. You don't, you know, like, you don't get any choices right now. But they're used to it now. And they're like, Dad, I'm watching this thing on fishing. Great, cool. Let me watch it with you. And then I just enjoy it with them. Why? Yeah. I want to know what they're learning from and what they're hearing. And it yeah. takes a lot of work. They're friends. It does. They'll say, man, this kid at school today, Dad, Dad did this. And there's some things, and they're in public school right now, and so they have... But they grew up in private school in the last three years. They've been in public school, and they have seen more of the world in the last three years than I was ready for. But I'm constantly engaged, and I created a culture where there's nothing awkward to talk to me about. Yeah. I never react weird. Even if they get in trouble or do something wrong, I'm very calm. And yeah. so they'll say, Dad, this kid said this today, or he showed me this picture on his phone, or he told me this, or what's this word mean? That is part of the culture we've created here. And I always go, let me tell you what it means. This is exactly what it means. And here's what God says about that. And that is not okay. But you know what? I'm not mad at you. You're just, it's how you respond to it. Okay, cool. Now I I know how to respond. That starts too, though, when they were younger. 
like when they were interested in silly stuff that we didn't really even care about, we learned about that and talked about it. And so we, on purpose, again, intentionally, and I love how you wrote it up here, that you can't microwave legacy. It's an investment over time. And we decided when they were younger that nothing is off limits, that we're going to start creating these pathways of communication to where they feel comfortable talking to us about anything and everything. Because right now, it's this little silly thing that they're interested in that we're really not interested in. But when they're teenagers <laughs> or in junior high, you know, and they're things that we actually do start caring about, we'll already have those pathways kind of open to do that. And I've noticed that with the boys. The hard thing, I think, for me as a mom, and most of you probably boy moms know this, as they get older, they pull away from me. I'm, I'm the doer. I do all the things and pack the lunches and get the clothes and blah, blah. But they want to be with Dad. They want to know what Dad has to say. And so they talk to him about stuff. He'll come in and tell me stuff that they talk about. I'm like, oh, they open up to you. They didn't tell me that, you know. But in their devotional time at night or whatever, you know, he'll he'll linger sometimes and stay. I remember one night y'all were in there, and I was like, hey, what? You know, I kind of walked in, and you were like, babe. I was like, oh. But they were opening up their hearts and, like, sharing with you. A, and so, a boy I'm thing, so too, glad. so it would have really ruined the moment if you would have, yeah. <laughs> yeah, some of them I probably don't need to know. But yeah. it's so good. I'm so glad that he's there and that he is present and that they can talk to him about that. You know, they come yep. to me with that. And their confidence stuff. comes from those moments, yeah. you know. And it really never changes. I mean, I still like to hear my parents proud or, man, that, that's awesome. Or, I mean, I really, mm -hmm. I believe in that. They always need to hear it. You know, there's three stages of parenting, and I'm, when I heard this, it just rang so true. The first one is master, mm -hmm. the second one is guide, and the third part is friend. And as a young child, it's not friend, you know, or not friends with our 8-year-old or our 12-year-old or even yeah. our 13-year-old. It's, it's I'm leading, God's given responsibility. But when you do it, having a hard line and not being compassionate or having that relationship can push kids away. Yeah. So it's not just having standards and knowing what they're watching, we have a trust relationship and a communication that I've, I work every day of my life, I feel like I'm working on this with my boys, so it always stays open. So then I can come to them and say, what are you watching? Or this is why you need to respond to that. And they honor what I'm saying and said, my, my, oh, here's my dad again. He always says stuff that's just dumb or doesn't, no, they honor what I'm telling them. And so master, then guide. Man, those teenage years, it's just a guide. You don't want to put them under a thumb and push them away, but it's like, I've taught you young. So now here's, here's some wisdom. You need more wisdom, I'll help you in any way I can. But I can't wait for the day, and some of you know what this is like when it's friend, when they're adults and they're out of the house, and just the quality time with your kids as adults. You know, I'm looking forward to that, but not mixing those seasons up. Yeah. You're not trying to be cool with your 11-year-old and be their best friend whenever they need someone to protect them yeah, and honor them. Proverbs 22.6, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to just real quick make a distinguished there, because some people think, well, that scripture didn't come to pass in my kid's life. It says, train them up in the way they should go, and when they're old, they'll not depart. It doesn't say they won't have seasons of departure. Yeah. There are times where you're like, the word is in there. Why are they acting that way? Mm -hmm. When they're old, they will not. You know what that means? There's an invisible bungee cord on their back <laughs> that God has put, and they can run and do as much as they want and go crazy. Mm -hmm. And the further they get, the tighter that gets. And I've seen it in every situation over and over in ministry that kid at some point just comes flying back to God, yeah. man. Whatever happens or whatever situation, God pulls him in, and there's restoration every time. So if your kids are away from the Lord right now or in that season, rest in knowing that there is a promise from God that if the word's in there, it won't return void. Yeah. So quickly, 10 guidelines for raising godly kids. And as I say this, you might not have kids that are young anymore. You might not have kids at all. I want you to think beyond just biological. As a church, we're a body and a family, and the Bible specifically talks about the local church and the, and the aspect of a body and a family. So we can't just be selfish and think about my biological family. We're spiritual family, mm -hmm. and some of you have a role. Your kids might be out of the house, and God's given you a role of a grandparent that some other kid in this church that doesn't have one needs, yeah. or maybe not have one that has what you have in you. Mm -hmm. So we need to have responsibility for each other as well and imparting into each other. Number one, start soon. Guidelines for raising godly kids. Start soon. Psychologists say that age four is a time when character is formed in, in every person. Think about that, four. So you want to start as early as possible. And even the boys at 12 years old right now, and it's starting, they're preteen, but there's still, there's that moldable part. 
I, my goal was to protect them from certain things at this age. You can't protect everybody all the time for their entire life, but in the most sensitive part of their development, mentally and spiritually, I have done everything I can to keep certain things from being sewn into their heart and said and images and things they've seen because it's such a critical point to where as they develop in life, that's why an enemy attacks childhood. Yeah. Some of your hardest things that you've dealt with in life were in your childhood. Mm -hmm. Why? Because there is a, a growing moldable season that he can put destruction that if it doesn't get uprooted, it will destroy an adult. Yeah. And so we have to get and think in the beginning of that soil. Number two, and I'll let you go with the next one, but number two is win every battle. Mm -hmm. There's three rules. You've heard me teach this before. Uh, and it works in our house, and it's really for younger. I mean, you don't use this for your 18-year-old, but uh, there's <laughs> three could. rules. I said, boys, works. good news. No more rules other than these three. And they're like, wow, really, just three? Yeah, isn't that exciting? Only three. Here's what it is. Whatever I say, do it right away, or mom, mm -hmm. right away, all the way, in the happy way. That's it. If you do that, you'll be okay. Never get in trouble again. But that means, hey, son, it's time to eat dinner. Five minutes goes by. <laughs> They didn't even show up to the table. Hang on, son. Three rules. Was that right away? No, sir. There's only three. You missed the first one. <laughs> or they, they take out the trash when you ask them to, but they're mad, kicking the trash can the whole way down to the street. That's not the happy way. And that translates, you're not going to want to hear this, so I'm going to say it anyways, to your walk with God. If he says it, do it right away, all the way, the happy way. All right, Lord, I don't understand it, but I'm going to obey and he is responsible for the outcome now, if you're under him. I am guiding them, and I need them to know to trust what I say. If I say stop, we've all heard this example, and they don't do it right away, and they run out in the street, they didn't see the bus coming over, that could be their life. It's that way with all of us, to trust the authority God's put in our life, that he's speaking through that and obeying that. And it's teaching them discipline, you know, and discipline is hard because you have to be consistent. It means when you say, okay, if you don't do this, then this is the consequence. And then you just, meh, don't do the consequence. Or sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. You're, you're giving them that, oh, that, this is optional. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? And so I think it's very important, you know, like you said, to win every battle. And even going through that kind of master season when we say, you know, don't touch the stove because it's hot. It's like when kids are little, you can't, you're not always going to like reason with a toddler. Sometimes your answer is going to be because I said so. <laughs> you know, as they get older, I think we can answer sometimes a lot of the why, mm -hmm. but um, definitely teaching them that is just instilling that authority too. And not that authority is bad, but that authority is there. It's God given to protect you, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and I think it's very important that they learn that at an early age when yep. they have a job and a boss one day and, mm -hmm. and all of that as well. So, so learn to listen is number three, mm -hmm. which we kind of touched on a little bit, mm -hmm. just about listening to them. When yes. they are used to talking and you engaging <laughs> what they're saying, they're used to opening up. Yes. So that way, when they're 16, they're not shut off in the corner somewhere. Right. And it doesn't mean they're not going to go through seasons like that. I mean, you can do everything perfectly right, and a teenager's going to do what a teenager's going to do. <laughs> right. But your job's to do your part. Yeah. The best you can, and God will take care of the rest. Well, and like in this season, for instance, you know, we have 12-year-olds. Um, I'm driving the mom bus everywhere. We're going to sports and school and all the things. And I've just made it a point, like I'm not on my phone when they're in the car. There's something about the back of my head, I guess, that is not intimidating to a boy. <laughs> and they just get real chatty in the morning, sometimes not so much. But at the end of the day, and they just talk about their day. And that's when we have some of the best conversations. When they were little, on the way to school, we would have our prayer time. And we still, we pray every morning. I'll pray or they'll pray. And we kind of talk about their day and go over everything. Um, so much conversation happens with us, at least, in the car um, you know, as a mom. And so I'm, I'm going to be sad when they're driving themselves to school because that is quality time for me. Now they may come home and talk to him kind of in the face about stuff, but that's usually yep. when Take they open up to me. Yeah. So that's been a great time for me to listen. Okay. I'm going to move quickly through these. Number four, keep your eyes on them. Mm -hmm. Proverbs 4:23. keep your heart with all diligence for out of it spring the issues of life. I talked about it earlier knowing what's planted in their heart. The one thing I've been teaching the boys, because I can't keep everything from being going through their eye gate and ear gate their whole life. So instead of, at a young age, I'm doing everything I can to protect that. But as they get older, there's the whole world out there. So now I'm teaching them why I am so strict about that. 
And that's what I want them to learn. And we've been talking about what the scripture says about what goes into your eyes and in your ears will go into your heart. And it, it plants there. And it's a spiritual thing. And it is very hard to get that out. Yes, you can, God can do anything. But let's just be honest. God can forgive and cleanse and heal. But memories are there no matter what. I mean, you, you can try to forget it and you can be forgiven, but it stays. And so I said, once it goes in, it's there. And I remember, just to give you a quick testimony, there was a kid, and I am so passionate about the purity of a child because I, as a youth pastor for many years, and now with Chi and Tracy and all the schools and even with our youth group and being involved to a degree with what's happening there, the amount of things kids are exposed to that has taken them from a child to an adult without them being ready for it is demonic. It really is. The enemy is using, and for kids, they're they're at the boy's age, and they're in seventh grade, but even in sixth grade and some in fifth grade, the pornography and the things that their kids are exposed to at 11 years old, 10 years old, it is, it makes me so mad. It's like, I don't know if I'm going to write a book or what. This is a passion of mine to protect young people from how the enemy tries to bring that darkness. And so I am just teaching them. I said, son, and I just break it down. I like give them every example. I'm like, let's say this happens. When you see that, it's going to go in your heart, and you might be 30 years old, and you'll have that memory. Or that might affect marriages. There's marriages that are ending divorce because a man never dealt or a woman never dealt with some things of purity in their heart that they let in for many years, and now it's destroying lives. So I, I like can't make it as important as I can say it. And now there was a kid at school one day in science class. Austin didn't even know him very well, and uh, he showed him something on his phone that he shouldn't see. He goes, hey, look at this, and held his phone in the middle of science class and said, look at this. What's the enemy trying to do? Plant that seed, that image, into my son's heart. And so he said, look at this. And so and Austin came home and told me as soon as he walked in the door. That was huge for me. Mm-hmm. And he said, and his teacher confirmed this later, I found out. It's kind of funny. But he looked, and he remembered what I said about the eyes, and it freaked him out to the degree of, I don't want that in my heart. He slapped that kid's phone out of his hand across the classroom in the middle. The teacher's teaching. All of a sudden, Austin goes, pow, and slaps the kid's phone. And the teacher looks at him, and he's like, it just looked like he was just beating this kid up or something. But, but he said, I hit that. So, and I said, well, good. I said, do you understand why you did it? Yeah. And I said, and he goes, Dad, do you think? And he was almost nervous to a degree of like, is that in my heart? Like, is that going to affect me? You know, whatever. I said, no, because your heart's pure. Your heart's right. You didn't, just because the enemy is going to try to do that all the time. And then I gave an example. There's songs that are, come on, people are going to speak things over you and say, yeah. you're this and you're that and you're not this. And I said, you have to learn, though, God will protect your heart. When you keep your heart in his hands, he'll cover you. And I said, yeah. you did the right thing. And he goes, yeah, it was blurry anyways because it was flying through the air when I, whenever he did it. Well, didn't he tell him something? He's like, don't show me. I don't want to look at that or something. Yeah, he's like, yeah. He's like, I'm not putting that in my heart. He'll say things that. Obviously, these kids weren't taught. That's like from scripture. And the kid's like, what? He's like, I'm putting that seed in my heart. And the kid's like, what? I'm just showing you, you know, like they don't understand. But what I'm saying is Joseph did that when Potiphar's wife came. There is a part of the body of Christ that needs to step up. And you need to protect kids, grandkids, those that are in your care from these things. It's It's huge, man. All right. Number five, quickly making memories huge, healthy culture, vacations, fun time. At least give 15 minutes with your kids every day. You, I mean, I mean, like looking and listening to them. Some, just like with a wife, you need to connect with your family as well, both parents. Mm-hmm. Number six, teach them the word. Teaching yeah. the word is huge. Uh, we're, we have plans. Pastor Tony and I have been meeting about just investing in families in this season. And one of the goals I have is to get a church devotional that's a family devotional, not just kitty, but yeah. where it can reach parents and kids. And just get them into all of your hands. And for us together as a church to maybe just do the same devotional together on every day. It's like one page. Just imagine if June 29th, we're all reading the same scriptures. We're reading them with our kids. And we're creating a culture in our home that the word of God takes priority there. Get the word in you and your children every day. Number seven, teach them finances. We've all said no one ever taught us money. It's funny. It's like school doesn't teach you anything. You just have to figure out. I didn't, when I was 18, I didn't know what taxes were or anything. I was like, I heard somehow, I guess when I get paid, I just knew they took it out of my check. Give them some of that information. Like say, hey, let me teach you what I've learned here because we want to prepare them for success in every way. So even with money, tithing. tithing. Our boys. Dave Ramsey has a great kids course too. We have we have the little clear little piggy banks and stuff that we taught them about tithing and sewing, you know, and saving. And they loved that. They were so happy to kind of learn 
you know, how to do that. And they get to see the fruit of that. Yeah. Because God backs his word. And so I'm teaching them that, and we're getting them. And so they get like 20 bucks in a birthday card. I'm like, and they've learned the math. Like, what's the tie? $2. Okay, we're going to give it to the Lord and watch what God will do. Because I put him at his word. He said, test me in this one area. So I said, he said for you to test, watch what he'll do. And when God blesses them, I make sure and highlight that. Son, yeah. that's not normal what just happened to you. Trust me. <laughs> that money comes there. I don't know how it happens, but they're like, Dad, I have $100. I'm like, why? Well, so-and-so gave me some money, and this happened. I won this event. I'm like, how? They tithe, man. God is like at a young age. I want them to see. And they I'll give, provide for you. you know, that, I think they have the heart to give. Me so much yeah. is they'll calculate the tithe, and then they on purpose want to give more than that because they love the Lord. And then mm. yeah, it's like they just <laughs> we're like, hey, can we borrow some money? <laughs> yeah, actually, I have borrowed money from my kids before. This <laughs> I just I was like, I'm learning too. All right, number eight, teach them discipline. <laughs> Teach them discipline, personal responsibility. One thing that she started that I wanted to do anyways, but you've enforced it, and it's really a culture now, is every morning our kids wake up, they make their bed before they start yes. their day. Okay, 70% of mornings they make their bed, but it's right. our, we're trying to, but it's, you know, it doesn't, it sounds like extreme. Why are you being so strict? We just want to create responsibility. Yeah. Like, there's not, you don't have a maid following you around your whole life. Like, you need to take care of what's yours. And so now I'll remind them, you're going to be late for school because you didn't make, go and make your bed. Why? Mm -hmm. They need to think that way. Their wife will thank us one day whenever yes. they pick their clothes up and yes. make their bed, okay? Um, number nine, build their confidence. Yeah, I thought this one was so good. I feel like confidence is such a weapon that we can give our kids, you know, to kind of put in their arsenal. And it's our job as parents to recognize their strengths and to call those strengths out. Because, you know, I mean, sometimes... We're all aware of our weaknesses, but I think sometimes when people can call out our strengths, hey, you're really good at that. You know, this is something that maybe God's given you mm -hmm. that you need to develop. And I think in our boys, we've seen certain things, especially because they're twins, like everything's a comparison, you know. So trying to, to find out, like, these are your strengths and these are your strengths and just calling those things out. We've seen them grow in confidence, and I think it just helps, um, you know, so much. And even weaknesses, I think the way you – point out weaknesses, I think you can still do it in a way to, like, I love the way you think outside the box. You don't think like every other person, mm -hmm. and, hey, God's going to use that. Or, hey, you're, you maybe you have one that's real stubborn or whatever. Hey, you're a leader, and God's going to use that. You know, you're strong. Mm -hmm. um, there's a way that we can do that, and I think the way we say that and the way we, you know, the words that we use really can frame our kids more than we realize. The words in your presence you know, yeah. be there for the big days, mm -hmm. you know, whatever it takes, be there when they get the award, yeah. when they have the game. You know what I'm so proud of our youth pastors for? One thing they do that is so good is their goal is to, as they can, Chi-Chi and Tracy, to get around to the games of the youth that are in this or whatever they're doing, some yeah. of their events of the youth in this church. And it's amazing the influence that, like, Chi-Chi and Tracy will get with some of your kids just yeah. because they show up to their game and someone – wow, like that's honoring, that's building their yeah. confidence. Like they came to watch me. How much more as a parent is that important to your kids? Like yeah. I know things happen sometimes, but showing them it's important is huge, huge, mm -hmm. huge for that. I mean, man, both my parents are in church at Life Church. Come on, isn't that awesome? That's pretty <laughs> cool to me, you know, that they're yeah. here. And so that encourages me that they're just in service. And if you ever seen my mom when I'm preaching, she's the most into it of anybody. I mean, she's <laughs> taking notes like, yeah. And I'm like, I always have a, someone to encourage me <laughs> sure, in my life. Number 10, show them honor, which is part of this too, man. Mm -hmm. you, our culture here, one of our core values is honoring people. Just that, man, you value what they value. You value them, you know. And even as they get older, trusting them with leeway. I'm doing that mm -hmm. with boys now. I'm like, what do you think? You know, like, I, I, I know you have wisdom. Like, let me hear what you have to say about it. And I'm valuing what they say and what they think as well and showing them it's value. And I've just learned with the boys, it's funny, because we have one that does not care, that would, like, smooch me in front of his friends and was like, that's my mom, I love her, you know. And then we have another that's like, oh, don't draw any attention to me. Mom, don't say anything. Don't make any, you know. And so yeah. I'm learning in even ways like that, you know, with sports and stuff, not to embarrass them or say something silly around their friends and stuff like that. Like, I'm learning you know, to honor, or if they say something to me, like, Mom, when you said that to my coach, it really embarrassed me. I'm like, I'm sorry, I didn't do it, you yeah. know, on purpose. Okay, I'm glad, that, you know, to know mm -hmm. that you feel that way, and I won't do that next time. And so I think that just makes them feel like you're not just, oh, kid, you know, just doing the little yeah. rub in their head or whatever yeah. people used to do, you know, knucklehead head work. Just not embarrassing them and showing them honor just as I expect them to show us honor. Mm -hmm. So I think it makes So I want you all to pray with us over families today. We're going to pray mm -hmm. over your family, the families in this ministry, and, and also in our community. We're in these schools, and the more we're learning about some of the 
homes and nests, if you will, these kids come from every day that are showing up at church, our school. You, some of it's shocking to me of what they're going home to experience mm -hmm. and then showing up at school and you never know by looking at them, the abuse or the things they've seen or things they've experienced. Yeah. And so we're going to cover families in this season against that attack because in these days, we can't afford to have any open doors that the enemy's coming through. Yeah. We need to close and lock those doors. If you'll stand up with me, I just want you to close out in prayer. And um, I guess a good segue in tonight is if you haven't come already, you are. I would still like for you to come to the Marriage on the Rock tonight and let's be proactive in our relationships and you might say things are going well or maybe they're going terrible right now we got to do it together you know and i've been praying about it we want to make available so many opportunities to minister to you and your kids and your family that we need you to take advantage of that so we have a marriage small group we have that's separate from even tonight that's just a relational small group and then of course tonight at 5 30 let's just bow our heads for a moment father in jesus name lord i just seal everything that was said today, Lord, that you would protect these words, Lord, that this truth would just go into every heart, God, that you would show them that this is your word, not ideas of man, not our creative ways of having a healthy family. Lord, we are just endeavoring to obey what you've said, Lord, and to lead like you've called us to lead. Lord, I pray over every marriage online that are in this room, that are a part of this ministry, Lord, that you would just be in the middle of their relationship. God, where there's strife, I pray that you'd replace it with unity and peace, Lord. Lord, where the enemy has come in back doors or maybe through childhood trauma or insecurities or relationships at work with other people, Lord, I just cover these marriages right now and these families, Lord, with your blood and your protection, that you would give angels charge over them to keep them, Lord. Lord, that the enemy would not bring insecurity in these relationships or maybe them doubting one another or not trusting one another. Lord, I pray that you would give them your love love for each other, that they would have agape love, Lord. Lord, we pray over our young people, God, our schools, our children, our grandchildren. God, protect them, Lord, their eyes, God, their hearts. Physically protect them, Lord, their purity, God. Lord, we just ask that young people, Lord, in this generation will not be given over to the enemy or, or given over to perversion, God, or darkness at these ages that they're being exposed through all of the media, all of the culture, all of the politics, Lord. I pray that they would hear your voice, God. Lord, that our schools are beacons of light, that they're places of revival, Lord. Lord, as you've started moving already in these schools, I pray that it would spread like wildfire, Lord. Lord, that the generation that was called a lost generation will now be a generation that is the foundation of this move of God in these last days. Lord, I pray, God, that you would send laborers across their path, those that are like our youth pastors and, and churches and all over the country, Lord, that we would get out of our walls, out of our services, God, and go out and infect this world with the kingdom, that we'd shine light in every dark place, God. Lord, I thank you that these families represented, Lord, are covered and protected by you, Lord. And I thank you that whatever the enemy meant for evil, Lord, you will negate that, you will cancel that, Lord, and you will rework their lives into success, into blessing, peace, Lord, and that they would be all you've called them to be. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. Amen.